you want doctors who are not greedy and sees a bald person walking into his office or a balding person walking into his office and say, oh, here's my next Mercedes I can buy. A lot of doctors did some terrible things. They weren't surgeons. They violated basic rules of surgery. And I would see all these patients. They would be coming to me routinely. So I had a huge practice of complications from all over the world where people would fly in and I would see what what other doctors did to them and you know get into involved with a plan on how to fix it. I am thrilled to host a true legend in the world of hair restoration surgery, Dr. William Rossman, a visionary who has not only transformed scalps but also the entire hair transplant industry. Dr. Rossman's journey is nothing short of remarkable. From pioneering FUT and FUE methods to having multiple patents that have set the standards for hair transplant surgery. His dedication to innovation doesn't stop there. He's currently at the forefront of biotech advancements with Amplifica, a startup aimed at revolutionizing hair restoration. Join us as we delve into the mind of a man who's been the beacon of hope for many. Understand the art and science of hair transplants and what's in store for the future of hair restoration. Get ready to be enlightened by the maestro himself, Dr. William Rossman. Let's just get started. So thanks again. Um, and I just wanted to know what were your early kind of interests and what led you to um, hair transplant surgery? It was just serendipity that I ended up in the field. I had just finished a venture and uh, there was an opportunity uh, in the hair business to uh, run a company. So I stepped in and, and um, became president of uh, the largest hair transplant group in the world. And that gave me an exposure to the old technology that was around since 1959. Yeah, because like I, what I saw on your resume is that you started off in like cardiovascular surgery. Going back in my early days, uh, I trained in uh, cardiovascular surgery with C.W. Lillehei. I was a fellow to him. And uh, during that time, I had done a lot of research and pioneered the injury aortic balloon pump, which I introduced into the marketplace. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, then I just decided I didn't really want to be a cardiac surgeon. So the, uh, I had a number of rotations on orthopedic surgery. Uh, when I got drafted into the military, they made me an orthopedic surgeon. I spent two years in orthopedics and a year in Vietnam uh, as an orthopedic surgeon in the war zones. And uh, so when I finished, I finished up in general surgery and got my boards in general surgery. I practiced for about 10 years in both Vermont and Hawaii. And then I ended up uh, with some business opportunities and stopped practicing for a while uh, and entering uh, alternative energy space. I built a quarter of a billion dollar company for alternative energy windmills in Palm Springs and sold that company. That was my first business venture. And, huh. uh, and I've been in a few things since then. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's in, an interesting transition, uh, to say the least, going from like orthopedic surgery and heart surgery to then doing hair. Uh, were there times when, you know, you missed some of those, you know, other types of surgeries? Or did you feel like, um, you know, you were able to apply the same types of skills, skill sets uh, that you kind of uh, honed in those other uh, specialties to hair? No, I, I don't think I ever missed the old surgeries. I found, literally fell in love with the hair transplant business because I love the patients. And there's a lot of interchange between the doctor and the patient. And uh, here you have the chance to make an improvement on somebody and they appreciate what you've done. Uh, the results are uh, meaningful to the patient's life. And, uh, and in that respect, you uh, incorporate into the patient's family in many ways. And many of the patients became extended families of mine. And I really like that part of the business. It's a, the technical side is just technical, but the, but the patient uh, analytic side, helping them through the process, planning. Um, as you know, hair loss is progressive. So you have a lifetime relationship with the patient. It's not just a single hair transplant that you do. You basically plan what you're going to do for the next 20, 30 years uh, with the patient as this progressive balding continues. What do you find to be the most like challenging part of, of the job, even maybe to this day? Well, the, the, the technical side has been interesting. Uh, as you know, I've kind of led the, the charge from from the old techniques of big plugs where people put pencil size plugs in a head right over here and sure. it looks like a 
like a cornrow on the head. And then um, mm -hmm. I, I moved to small grafts, follicular units in large quantities. I kind of pretty much led the world in that. Uh, in, in 1996, I started to do FUE and uh, the, uh, I started to experiment with it anyway. And between 1996 and 2002, I did a lot of uh, development of that technology and then published the first paper on it. And that became the, sta right. the new standard. I think everybody accepts that as today's modern standard of care for hair transplant. Yeah, I mean, you have a number of patents to your name. Uh, can you give me one or two that you feel like hold the most significance um, to, or meaning to you? There have been a few that have been very fun to do. One that I failed to get was in, uh, in uh, 1981, 80, I guess it was. I was reading a lot of it alternative energy, and I figured out how to extract oil from oil shale, filed a patent. Uh, I did it in the middle of the night, at about 3 in the morning, and dawned on me, I ran to my desk, drew some pictures, wrote a little paragraph, went to sleep. And of course, you know, you never remember anything you, in the middle of the night. And I did remember going to the desks. I went to my desk, looked at what I had done, and then I filed a patent within a week. Uh, three years later, I get a rejection from the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, Exxon had filed uh, the same patent three weeks before I did. And I was very proud of that one, the fact that, you know, how much money did they spend inventing the, the solution of how to get shale right. out of oil out of shale, and I, I figured it out in my sleep. Um, <laughs> so... That's amazing. I think my most significant uh, one that I was most proud of was a computer software patent, which um, uh, had to do with um, uh, how you display information in a graphic manner. So I figured that mm -hmm. out in the 19, late 1980s and patented it about that time. And uh, oh. th that uh, took, it took years before I could enforce the patent. I made a bit of money on that. That was a Amazing. very complex uh, insight into how you deal with structured information on in databases, and and made it really easy to do that. And today's standard is is pretty much what I invented. So when we last spoke, I was impressed with um, your work ethic and um, the fact that you told me that you, know, you still work seven days a week, and you said, you know, I'm up early. I can, I can do this podcast at any time. Uh, and that, you know, just uh, I don't hear that all the, you know, all the time from people. And so if you can just speak to success, what it takes to be successful and kind of what's worked for you in your life. I think you uh, have to be able to put in the efforts. You have to develop an insight into something that you're doing. Uh, uh, it has to have meaning to your life. Uh, and uh, everything I do has meaning. Um, I think uh, in my particular area, I think it has to have value to society. So everything I've done had some type of uh, societal value that uh, I've, I've done, whether, whether it was uh, surgery for, for patients or uh, windmills for alternative energy or uh, uh, biomedical uh, innovations and in, in the field of, t of laboratory testing, I, I always believed uh, strongly that that everything that uh, one does should make society better for for the effort, yeah. and and that's been a lot of my focus. I, as you said, I wake up at five thirty six every morning. I still do that, yeah. and I'm usually at work at my desk by six thirty, and uh, and begin, begins my day. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not enough. I think to just have that raw intelligence, I think you need to put in the work. And, you know, when you do that for decades, uh, you know, good things tend to happen. And, you know, it's, it's, I find that it's not, it's never luck, you know, people might look at, you know, your, all, all the successes you've had and say, oh, he maybe just got lucky here or there, but it's, it's that constant um, work and, and putting in the time, the effort, like you said, uh, eventually it yields pretty uh, incredible results. I'm, I'm very enthusiastic so, when I do things, uh, and the enthusiasm yeah. is somewhat contagious. So the people I work with, the people I hire with, get, get a little bit of that virus, if you will, that enthusiastic virus, and then they see the visions, yeah. and then they get excited. Makes sense. So you alluded to this earlier, but let's uh, go back to that paper that you wrote in 1995 about FUT surgery. Um, can you bring me back to like 
you know, what you were thinking as you were kind of developing that technique. And, um, you know, we, we, you mentioned the plugs from, you know, before that. And, um, you know, what it took to develop that FUT technique, you know, and, and were there other techniques at that time that you were kind of going between and then decided, like, no, I think FUT makes the most sense, um, you know, again, just back in 1995? Well, back in 1990, 90, when I was observing the plugs being put in, I wasn't uh, functioning as a surgeon in that business. I was the kind of the president mm -hmm. of the company. So I had to deal with all the patient complaints, and there were a lot of them. And patients were never satisfied with what they got. And uh, uh, so I uh, asked the patients what, what it was that they weren't happy with and what would make them happy. And once I understood what the patient wanted, which was to me a plea of the market, if you will, I then started to do small graphs or follicular units in large sessions. It was very, very difficult since the technology wasn't there to do that. Uh, it's a series of manual skills that you have to develop. So I went, the average surgery back in uh, 1990, 91, uh, done by the clinics all over the world were maybe 50, at most 80 graphs at a time, 80 pencil-sized graphs that were drilled out with a, I always kind of joke around with people like a black and decker drill on the back of the head or a dental drill, and then they were just moved like pencils in the front. And... Um, and they would do 80 per session, and every month they would do another session. So uh, you'd get 360 plugs put in the front after four months. And when they grew, they not only grew like plugs, but the graphs uh, would develop a, uh, a scar around them. So that would make them shrink, and they would look, look like stalks, not just graphs, but stalks popping up. And many of the hairs didn't survive the graft, uh, the transplant. So if you looked at a typical graft that might be, let's say, four millimeters in, in width, uh, everything uh, for the first, uh, the inner three millimeters would die. And the only grafts, that the hairs that would live would be on the outer rim of the grafts. And it was very evident that the blood supply wasn't getting into the inside of the graft. So small grafts right. became the obvious solution. So we, we started off, I think my first surgery was 700 grafts. That took me an entire day, uh, probably uh, eight hours, just, yeah. just to figure out how to do that. And then once I figured out how to do that, we went up to 900 and then 1,100 and 1,500 and worked our way up to as much as 5,000 graphs in a single day. But that took a, few, yeah. a couple of years to, to progress to that. The good news was is that as soon as I started doing them and the patients started getting results, I started publishing on them and promoting that what we were doing through an infomercial and I got the word out, and before you knew it, everybody in the world was talking about it, and everybody was wanting wanting that. And uh, they would go to their doctors, and they'd say, well, I want the, what this doctor is doing in California. And uh, if they didn't, yeah. they would fly to me in California to get, the, get it done. So business was booming, nice. if you will, and I couldn't handle the volume of patients no matter how big I grew the clinic. And uh, uh, so by 96, I published... Uh, uh, I guess the first major article with Bob Bernstein on the follicular units, and we discussed uh, how to go about diagnosing it, uh, how to make the diagnosis, how the logic of building the entire process from beginning to end, and how it fit into the patient's balding, progressive balding process. And in the process, we, we defined most of the standards used in the follicular unit uh, transplantation field. Then in 2002, when I uh, finally released the first paper on FUE, follicular unit extraction, it was called mm -hmm. a minimally invasive surgery, um, I had kind of reached the limit of what I could do in, in the quality of the work I did and, or the quantity of the work I did. And uh, I decided at that point, let it out and let's see what other doctors can do about improving or expanding on that technology. And of course, that's exactly what happened. It took many years, of course, before doctors uh, came up with innovations that really worked, and there were selective doctors around the world that have made major contributions into the field since I wrote the first paper on the subject. Right. Yeah, uh, that's great. And it sounds like it started with really listening to patients and the problems that they were having and the complaints that really maybe heralded some of these newer techniques. And the fact that 
you know, you were almost like you were taking kind of a zoomed out approach. You were running, you know, big uh, corporation where there was lots of hair transplant going on. And so you could take a step back and see what, what some of the problems were. I think as we're sometimes in our own, you know, smaller practices, we don't really get to see that, that big picture sometimes. So that, that's interesting. But then also, you know, taking that next step and, and, and hearing people out, you know, and, and understanding that what's going on now maybe isn't ideal. And there could be things that, that could be done to improve um, the surgery, you know. One of the axioms of business is always listen to your customer and give the customer what they want to buy. And uh, that wasn't what was done prior to 1991. It was deliver, deliver hair and don't ask the customer anything and uh, essentially tell the customer to keep quiet if they didn't like it. That was their problem. And that was very different. The, the victimization of this process occurred with a variety of celebrities. Um, many of them uh, came to see me and they had these awful plugs and they were affecting their career. Some, some of them had already died. A good friend of Frank Sinatra uh, told me that uh, Frank had, had uh, plugs put in his head and was very, very angry with his doctor and then he wore a hairpiece for much of his life. And there are many other famous people that are, were affected by that. One of the great crooners of the world, I did his surgery and he had plugs mm. and he wanted the plugs gone because it would affect his ability to get in front of an audience in Vegas and, and on TV, he had his own TV show and they would have to make up, make them up heavily just to try to cover up the plugs that he had. So I worked mm -hmm. on him uh, and it was quite an experience um, working with so many very famous people, people you read about and establishing personal relationships with him. Do you feel like your surgical background and the fact that you had trained in some pretty rigorous, uh, you know, surgical disciplines, do you feel like that helped you create the an FUT approach? Just because, you know, people come into hair from many different backgrounds, some a little less surgical than others. Uh, did that did that help you in some way, you think? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that uh, I was never terribly challenged by the surgery because the surgery was much simpler than any things I, the things I used to do. So right. uh, for me, it was not a big technical challenge to do it. Um, so, so I didn't have uh, limits in front of me saying I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that because I technically was trained so well in other fields of specialty. And many of that applied. I, I learned a lot about uh, uh, problems and how to fix problems from my war experience and from a general sur surgery experience because uh, surgery yeah. requ uh, required wounds and FUT required a big incision in the back of the head and then you would take out a piece of scalp and then you would sew it together. And uh, a lot of doctors did some terrible things when, it, when they did that because they weren't surgeons. They, they, they violated basic rules of surgery, uh, closed wounds with tension, which is a, a no-no in the world of surgery, never put a wound under tension. And they would get necrosis of the back of the head. And, and I would see all these patients, they would be coming to me routinely. So I had a huge practice of complications from all over the world where people would fly in. And I would see what, what other doctors did to them and you know, get into involved with a plan on how to fix it. So after that 2002 paper, it seems like it took until maybe closer to 2010, from what I can tell, because again, I wasn't in the field at that time, for FUE to become just more popular. What's your sense on that? Like, wh why did it take eight years, 10 years for it to become just more widely accepted? Well, first of all, FUE was difficult to do. Uh, just the technical challenge was was difficult. It took me uh, six years to figure out all the nuances of how to do it. So uh, in 2002, uh, three things happened. Uh, when I, I published my paper in, the, in probably the most prestigious journal in the field, which is Dermatologic Surgery, I, I uh, presented this before the ISHRS, uh, International Society for Hair Restoration Surgeons, and I gave out uh, 600 DVDs to the audience with uh, how to do an FUE and uh, handed it out to everybody in the audience. Uh, the day after the conference had closed, I get my first call from a doctor in Canada, and he basically said, look, I've found your talk amazing. I read, I looked at your DVD. 
He says, I have a bunch of questions. And he spent an hour on the phone talking to me and asking me how to do this and how to do that. The very next day after my phone call in the Toronto newspaper, there was a full page ad of a breakthrough in hair transplants by this doctor. <laughs> and, and this was the first <laughs> of, of something that happened yeah. all over the world. It happened the same way. <clears throat> so the doctors uh, all started doing it and you had follicular holocaust. Uh, the failure rate was almost 100% on everybody that was mm. done. There were lots of victims and, uh, and there was no teaching. There was no ability to teach anybody. I took in a fellow every year. That's one, one surgeon a year that I could train. But, but that's as much as I could handle. I couldn't train the vast number of doctors. They're out there. I would hold classes, sometimes three, three or four-day classes. Uh, I'd get 25, 30 doctors fly in from all over the world to, to go to the class and watch what I was doing. And I would show FUE or, or um, uh, the, how to do FUT. I worked with uh, Dr. James Harris in, in Denver, Colorado, and we held classes on FUE there um, just to try to teach people how to do it. But uh, it took years uh, to handle these delicate grafts. You know, you keep a graft out of the body for 20 seconds and it's dead. The surgeon doesn't know mm -hmm. it's the hair died. The, gra the hair just is dead. And then you put it into the patient's head and you put a dead graft in there, and a dead graft will never grow. And that's what happened, is that many times the complexity of doing the, the numbers of uh, FUEs, uh, F FUE grafts, uh, and the amount of damage that got done to the grafts and handling them uh, was so significant that very rarely did any of this grow. And this lasted probably into 2010. There were some doctors uniquely that were able to figure it out on their own, Dr. Cole, in Atlanta, Georgia, about a year after I released the paper, Dr. James Harris in Denver, uh, Colorado, developed a, a special type of entrance, uh, instrument with a new approach um, on how to do FUE. Uh, some doctors adapted it, and, and he would teach the doctors on how to, how to adapt that, that to their practices, and they did better than the majority of doctors that would just do it on their own. I remember... Uh, at the ISHRS meeting in Amsterdam, uh, I met uh, on the boardwalk, two ladies approached me, and they were young women, and they said, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and they introduced themselves as young doctors, and they were uh, said, they said, well, you know, we, we started doing FUE about nine months ago. I said, well, that's very nice, uh, uh, and how are your patients doing? She says, well, they're doing terribly. We're getting terrible results, but we think we're getting how to do it. We're just figuring it out how to do it. And about two years later, at a, uh, another ISHRS meeting, I met the ladies again, and they were at, the, at a table called uh, uh, Luncheon with the Experts. <laughs> and they were trying. <laughs> so I went over to the table and listened, and they certainly knew what they were doing. So they had figured it out. But at what cost yeah. to the patient? How many patients got damaged and hurt in the process? And, and that's not the way to do it. Most doctors learn FUE by going on YouTube and watching a YouTube FUE does not help you and make you a surgeon. So, right. so that, that was a big problem. Uh, there were breakthroughs that, are, yeah. that started to appear uh, in, in 2011. I think the artist robot came out, which I invented back in 2003, patented and, and um, sold the patent to a company called Restoration Robot, Robotics and in 2006, and it took them about four, five to six years to develop the robot and make it commercial and get it through the FDA. And that robot was, was designed to handle uh, the inability of most surgeons to do the FUE part of the surgery. So the robot had automated that process. But by 2010 and 11, many people had developed ways of doing it themselves. They may not have gotten a 100% result. Maybe they got a 50, 60, 70% survival, and that seemed to be adequate for many of the doctors. Maybe not for the patients, but, but for the doctors, the patients would come back for a second surgery to, to fix up the things that didn't work. Uh, the, some real breakthroughs occurred in about 2016 when uh, uh, the three different places uh, in different parts of the world all came up with, with a a modified punch that made it easier for the doctors to do the surgery. And it, it was interesting that it was 
coincidental that it all came out with about with it about the same time, and it commercialized it. And <clears throat> once that technology got adapted, uh, it was um, doctors started getting much more success in doing the FUE. And today, now I think FUEs can be done reasonably well. The problem with FUE is it's a complex process. It involves thousands of individual grafts that are easily damaged from touching them, from exposing them to the air, from any manipulation that you do as you move them from place to place. You store them, they, you get damaged in storage. Uh, and by the time they get into the, to the head and implanted into the head, uh, that produces more damage. So, so uh, uh, the, the, the consistency uh, of quality results across the world is not great and because uh, this is like a mass production process and mass production mm -hmm. requires good quality control systems in place and doctors are not trained on quality control systems. So uh, this, this surgery has six, seven, sometimes eight technicians working with the surgeon to do the surgery and that is a, mm -hmm. a nightmare for quality control because everybody in, inflicts their own style to what they're doing, and that's not good. Yeah, no, you uh, brought up a ton of excellent points. Just going back to the early days of FUE, what were you using to harvest? Was it just the, the like a mechanical type of like twisting motion uh, with, with an instrument, or how did you initially do the harvesting? I used strictly punches uh, and did it manually and had no motorized anything. I developed various designs of punches, and and I ended up using a serrated punch, which was probably the best way to get it out. And I did all right with it, pretty good. Uh, but I didn't uh, mm -hmm. feel comfortable doing uh, thousands at that point. I right. think the biggest surgery I did was about 400 grafts, FUE style, and and that was by 2002. Uh, when the world started doing them, they started to do hundreds and even thousands quickly. Uh, I went. To, I remember, at one of Dr. Harris's uh, meetings where I was on the faculty. Uh, I won't mention the doctor's name, but uh, he had a reputation of doing three thousand FUE grafts uh, in every surgery, and he did it in about fifteen minutes. So, mm -hmm. he at one point during the surgery, we had human volunteers, and they were uh, uh, willing to be worked on by novice doctors. So this doctor says, "Would you like me to show you?" how to do the surgery, and uh, I, I said, sure, let, let's see. So he takes a punch and a drill, and he literally drills out 300 graphs in, in, under, in under a minute, and uh, I'd never seen anything so fast. He didn't look at what anything he was doing. It was just punching holes in the head. Just so blind. I, so I stopped him, and I immediately took out a whole bunch of these holes that the graphs, so to speak, they speak, there was almost no graphs in, in any of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was charging blind patients. Punching. And blind punching. And mm -hmm. he was charging patients, mm -hmm. you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a surgery to do this. And of course, the patients weren't getting any results, but they all came to him because he had great marketing and great social media, developed a very classy image, had offices in the United States and in Europe. And he had a sense of bigness associated with him. And eventually he lost his licenses in most, most places that he had a license in and couldn't practice because that was what he was doing. But it took a long time for the powers that be to get him out of the business, so to speak. Yeah, and you referenced this earlier, but I think one of the biggest problems in um, our industry is people not really having a great way to like learn this craft. You know, and even if you want to learn it, it's not the easiest thing to, to figure out or to <clears throat> become an apprentice with someone or to join their practice. The, the opportunities aren't always there. Um, I mean, I would also argue that many people don't even seek those out. And, you know, they're in a completely different specialty and they might want to offer hair transplants on the side. Um, so I think one of the biggest issues is just the, the, the education that, that needs to happen for someone to really learn how to do this stuff well. And there's just a lack of it. And I think part of it, this is my opinion, I want to hear your thoughts. Part of it is just lack of opportunity, but part of it is also a lack of people's desire to invest themselves in truly figuring out how this works, how to do good, safe work that's artistic and that's technically sound. 
Last year, for example, I participated in a three-day course, beginner's course, on teaching people all about FUE and how to do it all. And one day was spent with cadavers. And at the end of the course, and these were, there were about 65 novices, uh, people who have never done a hair transplant before. And at the end of three days, I asked for a show of hands. I said, how many of you now, after attending one, one day of didactic work, one day of cadaver work, and then one day summary work, how many of you feel comfortable to open your practice and offer this service to patients? 90% of the 65 beginners raised their hand and said that they were ready to do it. Well, that's kind of ridiculous. Th three days mm -hmm. co training course <laughs> and think you can, yeah. you can master a surgery and then offer it to yeah. patients. This was like that, that meeting in Amsterdam that I had. You know, everybody had the idea, you know, uh, that you could do it just by seeing it. You know, there was, there's a joke in, in surgery, see one, do one, teach one. Well, that, that doesn't apply. You, you don't want to be a victim of that type of process, that's for sure. Yeah, I think like with any <clears throat> with any procedure, um, to, to learn how to do it well, you really need to spend time with someone who's doing it on the regular and be there with them, learn alongside them. And that just, it's, uh, it's hard to do for someone when that's not, there, there's no like set course for becoming a hair transplant surgeon. You know, if you wanna be cardiothoracic surgeon, you wanna be a head and neck surgeon, facial plastics, general plastics, there's like a, you know, there, there, there's programs for this. Uh, maybe ISHRS has a few fellowships, but it's not many. And so it's difficult for people to even figure out how, how to go about that, how to get that proper training. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, my, my journey was also somewhat serendipitous in that I didn't expect to do mostly hair work. Uh, you know, I was a fellow in facial plastics in St. Louis at Wash U, so I spent a lot of time at that facility for lots of other cadaver courses. But, but yeah, so I was at, I was in St. Louis, and they gave me an opportunity to, you know, go to like two different, um, you know, courses like over the weekend, and um, they gave me some options. And one was a uh, Jeff Epstein's, you know, a course in, in Miami, and I, I didn't really expect to. To like it. I didn't know that much about it. Um, I, I, you know, we had some questions in our ENT in-service exam about hair transplants, but I was never formally introduced to it other than from the textbook. So I had a, a wonderful long weekend um, with Epstein and his team. Um, and and then we just kept the communication going and ended up pretty much doing like an apprenticeship of sorts for, for about two years after my fellowship while also, you know, practicing and starting my own um, thing for facial plastics. So, um, but, but again, it wasn't like something very formal that, you know, like now you can go and do this. It was just, he offered me the opportunity and it was a, a good working relationship for a few years. And I think we, we both kind of benefited from that. And, uh, but, but, but again, it's like, you have to take someone who already has like a solid foundation and skill set that, you know, I could have just gone on to just do my facial plastics work and uh, I didn't need to do hair like from a financial perspective but um, having been introduced to it and really you know kind of falling in love with it um, then I decided to dedicate myself more to it but I find that a lot of people with good solid surgical training um, they almost don't have a need to learn this extra skill set um, so if they offer it they just do it on the side you know it's just like yeah we offer hair transplants they never really learned how to do it maybe through a weekend course or something like that. And they just figure they'll just offer it. You know, they have a team that, that arrives from, from, from just anywhere, right? Uh, a collection of, of technicians and who pretty much do the whole surgery. So that that's just seems like that's uh, the state of affairs uh, today. So um, it's sad. Hopefully more people decide to, to dedicate themselves to this um, skill set and, and to this art form. It's not the technical stuff component alone that's important. There is understanding a lot about uh, the physiology of the hair, the physiology of, of the balding process itself, um, the skin diseases of the scalp. There are many diseases of the scalp that you don't want to transplant. And uh, if you don't understand those diseases, you'll end up transplanting them in guaranteed failure, 100% failure on those, on those patients. Uh, but doctors who don't understand scalp diseases will just see somebody balding and say, oh, this is $10,000 for my pocket. 
I can go ahead and do this transplant. And uh, uh, the patient ends up with a complete failure and uh, patients are too embarrassed to go forward. Um, and that's a big problem. Uh, there are, as you know, uh, clinics uh, offshore in Turkey in particular, in which mm. there are more than 500 illegal clinics in Turkey which have no physicians and only technicians running it and who only understand uh, how to do maybe the FUE and they may be good at it, may, they may not be. Uh, they may not be. They may be good at the anesthesia. They may not be. Uh, I read an article just recently that there were 20 deaths reported in the past two years in Turkey between dental and hair mm -hmm. transplant surgeries. And if there are 20 reported deaths, then you know that probably there are 10 times that number. So do you want to go ahead and put your life on the line to have somebody administer anesthesia and not know what they're doing? We had a death in California back in maybe the early 2000s in which a, a doctor literally overdosed somebody on Marcaine, and he didn't, never did a hair mm. transplant before. And the patient died during the surgery, and the, the surgeon didn't know the patient was dead. And then at the end of the surgery, mm. finished and said to the patient, now you can get up. And of course, the patient had died some time earlier from an overdose of Marcaine. And so the anesthetics mm. can be very lethal if you don't know what you're doing. Mm. So I think, you know, People look at the hair transplant as a nothing procedure, and I look at this as a like any other surgical procedure. Everything's got its risks, right. and you have to have somebody knowledgeable that commands all aspects of it. Also, the the when you talk about the the uh, dynamics, the uh, the the numbers of hair, you know, we have we have a hundred. Let's just round it up for a typical Caucasian: about a hundred thousand hairs on the head, mm -hmm. and of the hundred thousand hundred thousand hairs on the head. They're, they're located in 50,000 follicular units. Those, we call those graphs or follicular units. They're interchangeable. Uh, actually, we have about 110,000, so it ends up with about 2.2 .2 hairs per follicular unit. For a typical Caucasian, the typical Asian has about 1.95 uh, hairs per follicular unit. In other words, they have about 95,000, 90,000 hairs on their head. And the typical African has about 70,000 hairs on the head. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we have to understand what w what we can actually move. There's a band around the side of the head and the back of the head that's reported to be three inches high, and that band, uh, three inches high, is about twenty to twenty five percent of the total area of the head. So, if you take generously twenty five percent as the as the permanent zone of hair that we never lose when you get complete balding. Because if you look at people who are fully bald, you'll notice that they still have a rim of hair around the side and back of the head. So th those people will have have a donor area of, of about 12,500 follicular units or 12,500 grafts. And now the question comes up, how, much, how many of those grafts can be removed without making you look bald in the back of the head? Well, we already know that many of these people who are coming from Turkey are coming back to Europe and the United States, and they're bald in the back of the head. And the, yeah. the, the Tur Turkey t clinics are taking out five, six, seven thousand grafts out of the head, and they have no regard for the, for the reserves. And when I do a surgery, I, I, I look at not just what I'm doing today, I'm looking at how my patient's going to change tomorrow and, and 10 years from now. And I want to basically make sure I leave enough residual hair to follow the transition from as they get from one class of balding, maybe balding just in the front, and then they move the balding to the top and the back crown. And as they move it, you, you can actually keep up with the balding uh, with transplants if that's what you want to do. There are also some wonderful drugs today that are great at slowing down or reversing the balding process. And, and doctors mm -hmm. should always try patients on drugs before they go forward with transplants because some men get remarkable results from just drug management. So I think uh, uh, you, you want doctors who are not greedy and sees a bald person walking into his office or a balding person walking into his office and say, oh, here's my next Mercedes I can buy. Uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to that, you, you, wanna, you want the doctor to say, well, what's good for the patient? How can I basically mm -hmm. help this patient? And maybe we can, we can treat him with medicines and maybe we can reverse the balding process. And I think that that's, that's uh, uh, basic to our principles. Uh, above all, do no harm. 
and in my opinion, yeah. unnecessary surgery is harm. So I think if you if you go ahead and do surgery as a surgeon, and everybody coming in who's balding, then you're not a very good surgeon and you're not a very good doctor. Yeah, I agree. Uh, recently, I think this was like maybe two weeks ago, uh, my nurse, my hair nurse, she was working from home right now because she's recovering from a shoulder surgery. So she's at home and she's following up with patients and she always does our six month follow ups and they tend to be video follow ups anyway. So she emails uh, our group and she says, you know, patients are super happy. Everyone's doing well. The ones I spoke to today was like, I don't know, six or eight to eight people. She said just one person had a complaint. And I was like, you know, well, what's that about? You know, as I was reading this email. I'm like, oh, gosh, well, you know, what, what, what's what's wrong? So basically the complaint from that patient was that um, he wants us to he wants us to stop asking him about medical therapy, whether he's on it or not. Um, he's getting annoyed by that. So I said, I can deal with that uh, complaint, um, you know, because we do want them on medical therapy. Uh, you know, there are very few cases where uh, we feel like maybe, you know, the, the risks outweigh the benefits if uh, Norwood 7, you know, um, depends on, on the case, of course. But there are times when maybe medical therapy doesn't make as much sense. Um, but for most people getting surgery, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, so I'll, I'll take that risk of, uh, of annoying a patient with uh, us asking him, are you, are you on your medical therapy yet? Um, so I wanted to go back to um, this question of, do you feel like the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of FUE surgery? You know, as you know, FUT maybe isn't as commonly done. Um, surgeons aren't really learning um, the art of FUT and how to do it properly. But we know that there are real benefits, uh, especially for, for specific patients. Uh, would you want to see us, in general, as a field, doing more FUT surgery for the right individuals? Well, there's a real problem here, and that is, I would say, 95, 98 percent of the doctors entering the field only learn FUE, and very few people come from surgical backgrounds like you and I do. So uh, to bring somebody who's an expert in FUE, let's assume that they become terrific FUE surgeons and, and get good results from FUE, and then you try to offer FUT as an option in what they offer their patients, uh, it may not uh, work out for them because uh, they don't want to get involved with sur a surgical procedure. And as you know, uh, removing a strip of scalp uh, with a strip surgery is easy for you and I because we're basically trained as surgeons. But if you've never held a scalpel, if you've never done anything like this, uh, you're loath to basically go that route. So I think it will be very hard for the pendulum to swing backwards simply because mm -hmm. the provider base is mostly FUE, FUE trained, and they are resistant, fundamentally resistant to the FUT. Now, there are enough people like you and I out there that are not averse to doing FUT. So uh, when I have women who have hairline lowering procedures, mm -hmm. for example, and I bring the hairline down to the normal position, mm -hmm. I, I offer FUT always as my primary yeah. solution. Uh, to shave the back of a woman's head for an FUE doesn't make any sense to me. And most women won't want the head shaved, the back of the head shaved. Mm -hmm. So while a man can, can easily get a short haircut and, and it'll grow out within a week or two pretty quickly. So that's a whole different situation for a woman. So I think there are many conditions where, where FUT is a preferred surgery. And, and you and I both know that. And maybe maybe the market will segment out where people that are offer the skills like uh, being able to do a strip surgery safely without cutting nerves and significant blood vessels in the back of the head are, are offered by people trained like you, plastic surgery people like me, who, who know how to do it. And there are many of us there, but not as many of us as there are the FUE surgeons that are popping up all over the world today. Yeah, also for eyebrows, we find that uh, FUT is really uh, valuable for really seeing the curl of the hair. You know, that's just something that we don't talk about as often for scalp cases, but for eyebrows, it's just so critical. So we find that we could, I mean, you could do long hair FUE uh, as well, but we just feel that FUT just serves its uh, purpose there for uh, eyebrow work. So that's another just indication for us. But yeah, for women, I think we're doing a FUT maybe 
eighty percent of the time uh, nowadays. So for sure, for guys, it's it's very difficult. Even when I feel like someone's a great candidate for FUT, for me to convince them that that is the better uh, route, it's very difficult. So maybe ninety eight, ninety nine percent of the time, we're still going with FUE, even the times when I think FUT makes more sense for them. Um, so. Okay, and then just going to this idea of like picking a surgeon, you know, for a lot of patients that are trying to make that decision, um, my thought is that they really should do their research about the individual surgeon and what they can offer them as opposed to uh, focusing too heavily on the equipment that they have. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, do you think that the, the devices do matter? And, and if someone's not using one of the few accepted, you know, or considered to be the, the better FUE device, let's say, that they shouldn't go to that surgeon. Um, I just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm, I'm a somewhat of a basic guy. You know, first, when I meet a doctor, I want to like the doctor. I want to bond with the doctor and establish a relationship with him. I want to understand that the doctor uh, cares about me and about my problem. And you can see that quickly. If, you, if, a, if a doctor turns you over to a salesman to sell you an FUE, then obviously the doctor doesn't care much about you, <laughs> just cares about your money, and that's a whole different bag. So I don't employ salesmen. I never have in my practice. Yeah. I, I, I'm, it's always a one-to-one -one between me and my patient. Uh, of course, you know, I've got 30-plus years of doing this, and, and I've had many patients that are out there now uh, that have started finasteride, for example, as soon as it came out in the mid 90s and have been on it ever since. I've seen some of my patients mm -hmm. that I did in 1992 and three uh, recently who called me or come to my office and see me. And it's nice to see that the hair is still there. Uh, I've had patients that have been on finasteride, for example, for 20 years and they've been stable. And they say, well, they've had a hair transplant, they're stable, uh, 20 years of finasteride, ah, hell with it, I'll, I'll get rid of it. And they, stop the finasteride within three months, the more hair is falling out. And it's not the transplanted mm -hmm. hair, but the native hair that falls out. And then I get a panic call. Oh my God, I can't believe what I did. I stopped my finasteride. Can you give it back to me so I can go back on it? So people ask me, how long does finasteride last? And I basically say, pretty much your lifetime. And it keeps a lot of hair on your head that you might have lost otherwise. And I've seen this now going 25 years. So I've been around long enough to see this. Uh, that one of the advantages of somebody like myself is because I've got so much, so vast experience and the surgeries in yeah. the thousands. Yeah, so then looking ahead, I know that you're involved with um, some of the biotech, uh, you know, important, um, you know, different molecules that are coming out and, and uh, you're playing a key role in that uh, with uh, Amplifica. If you can uh, speak to some of what you're working on, I know you can't really go into all the details, um, but uh, yourself and Dr. Plykus have, have been working on uh, Scoob 3, osteopontin. Can you just speak to, you know, whatever you want to say about them and um, what the future you think looks like with some of the newer, you know, drugs that we might be seeing that, that might supplement the finasteride, minoxidil, and some of the other things we have but are, you know, kind of limited on today? To educate your audience, I've been working um, with Dr. Max Plykus, who I've known since he came to the United States many years ago. And I kind of mentored him for a little bit of the time. Uh, and he ended up uh, with his PhD uh, and uh, now runs the Department of Regenerative Medicine at UCI. And he's brilliant. He's, uh, he uh, f looked at the hairy mole on a person. And he says to himself, why is there hair in that mole? And he, so like an inquisitive mind would do, he got biopsies of the hairy mole, he ran them through mass spectrometry to identify all the proteins that were in there, identified eventually 25 key proteins that are probably related to hair, worked his way through the proteins to find out which ones uh, were particularly valuable at, at stimulating hair growth, like osteopontin, as an example. And, and then he um, uh, developed, we, 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 we got human volunteers to supply hair that they put into mice. So we got human hairs transplanted into mice. And then we had two groups of mice, ones that just had the transplants and ones that got, for example, osteopotin. And, and the ones that got 
osteopontin got instant growth of the hair. Within three weeks, all the hair grew that we transplanted on the, the control group. There was no growth. So we're now trying that on humans through clinical trials through a company called Amplifico, which Dr. Plikas and myself and uh, a couple of other people formed back in 2018. And uh, uh, we're in clinical trials on some of these drugs, and Scooby will be behind it uh, as well. And and he's he's a prolific inventor and creator. So he, he keeps coming up with new drugs, and I'm sure uh, Amplifico, our company, will keep taking on these drugs and and trying to work their way through the, through the path to clinical trials. And at this point, we'll maybe know something in a year from now from some of the trials we're doing at the present time. I also have another company no, go ahead, go ahead. called Engraft, mm -hmm. uh, which I formed about five months ago. And this is a spinoff of a partnership I had with Dr. Pascal Bougim of Paris, France, who's one of the true brilliant inventors in the world in hair transplant uh, instrumentation and technology. And he and I have worked on a variety of patents and have developed many, many patents together. And we put this company together called Engraft, which uh, has taken ownership of the patents. And the goal is to be able to change radically the way hair transplants are done today. Today, as you know, it's complex. There's a lot of little pieces, moving parts that are constantly around that cause points of failure. And I can tell you, I visit many doctor's offices over the years, and I identify points of failure in the doctor's offices that I visit and uh, failures in the quality control process. So we, we've uh, basically tackled the whole issue of how an FUE is done, and we will eventually have technology that will reduce the entire procedure to a two-hour surgery with one assistant, one or two assistants and one surgeon for maybe 3,000 grafts. And I see that within a few years. And that technology is presently mm -hmm. being built. That's interesting. And I think you told me that um, you, you might have me beta test uh, um, you know, one of these devices one day uh, once it's ready for testing. And then in terms of the different molecules that you're working on uh, with Amplifica, uh, do you anticipate that being more of an injectable type of product or more of a topical or possibly a pill or it just will depend on, on the molecule? We start off on the, on the experimental level with injectables because it's easy to do with the mice. They're not too cooperative with taking pills and creams. But uh, yeah. mo most of these things that are injectable can be turned into creams and topicals and uh, possibly even a pill. So I think uh, how it'll end up in the commercial space will be significantly different than what we're doing in the experimental space at the present time. Right now, the clinical trials are being done by injection. The humans who have volunteered, the people who have volunteered on that, uh, get injections uh, periodically, and then uh, we'll wait to see what happens uh, with their hair growth. And do you think that the, ultimately we'll have less of a need for surgery, or do you think that surgery will still be important and relevant, uh, but you'll, we'll just have some other additional, uh, you know, ways of, of improving hair or restoring hair or, pre, or pre, you know, preserving hair. Um, how do you see that playing out like with, uh, you know, numbers of, of surgeries that will be done once these are out, these, these medications? I think like uh, drugs like finasteride when they came out, uh, even though it was a solution for hair loss, it, for many people, uh, many people just didn't take it for whatever reason. So uh, even if we came up with a breakthrough and it became a commercial product, uh, I don't think you would get immediately adaptation by society across the board. And there will be many people who will continue the bowling process and, and pay no attention to it. Now, one of the important pieces to me is, yes, we will make improvements in drugs and there will be better drugs hopefully on the market that will be more dependable, more reliable to induce hair growth. However, uh, there's going to be an entire huge group in the middle that are not going to take these medications. And uh, right now, hair transplants in the United States are sitting up here cost-wise. Hair transplants in Turkey are sitting at the bottom here, but you risk your life and you risk your looks and other things by, by taking this route. So. So uh, there's this entire middle group in between that if prices came down and hair transplants became more affordable, 
maybe we would open up the market more to people uh, that that uh, uh, would want hair and be willing to take the surgical solution. I don't think that these medicines are going to reverse hair when the hair has been dead for some long period of time. So when you have these people with advanced balding that you see, uh, I'm not so sure we'll be able to regrow those hairs, even with these new medicines. I think these new medicines mm -hmm. make the assumption that the stem cells that, that drive the hair growth are still present. But at some point, mm -hmm. I believe that those stem cells that are sitting in the, in the ball atrophic scalp will eventually just die off and will not be there anymore. And uh, hair transplant solves the problem because it introduces stem cells along with the hair grafts. But mm -hmm. I think you're not going to introduce them. You're not going to stimulate uh, stem cells that are just not there anymore. So I think there's a limit to how much drugs will do. But I think uh, looking at the young men coming upstream that will be entering the world and facing their balding, I think over in the next five or ten years we will have better drugs that are more effective, more dependable. And, and whether it's Amplifica or some others that are coming up with drugs, uh, it's yet to be seen. I, I want to put a caution. It's a good opportunity to, to caution the listening audience that, that on the Internet and on many blogs and forums, you see announcements of breakthroughs coming through all the time and they're not backed up by any clinical science, but by great marketing hype. And many people mm -hmm. get, get all hyped up about this stuff. And I'm, I'm constantly on Reddit and, and I see this type of hype. And it worries me a little bit because people then turn away from good known options, go to these ridiculous options that may be very costly. And, and I'm not a big uh, fan, I'd like to protect the consumer from this process, but I don't know. I'm just one voice in the wilderness, I think. And speaking of some of the concern that's been raised online, uh, there are people who are extremely afraid of finasteride, you know, because of the potential, theoretical potential for post-finasteride syndrome. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been prescribing this stuff now for, let's say, five years, but, you know, you've been prescribing it for much longer and seeing people on it for decades. Um, what are your thoughts on post-finasteride syndrome or, you know, just other side effects related to finasteride? Uh, Dr. Haber, Bob Haber in Cleveland uh, polled, I think, 60 doctors, 60 elite doctors uh, around the world uh, that may have written, let's assume, 10,000 prescriptions for finasteride. And he wanted to find out from these doctors what the incidence of post-finasteride syndrome was amongst these doctors of some 600,000, 400,000 patients, whatever the number is. And he, he, he found that there was no post-finasteride syndrome from, reported by these doctors. Now, in my practice, I've had one patient report post-finasteride syndrome. He got finasteride from me, got into the car on the 405 freeway, called me. He popped one pill in the car. He, two hours later, he called me from the office, in the office and he said, Dr. Rassman, I'm impotent. This was two hours after he took his first pill. The first time he took first. finasteride. So I said, well, you're obviously not a person to use this drug. And I told him not to, not to take the drug anymore. And, and he persisted taking the drug and each time asking me for a prescription, which I wouldn't give him. And I wrote to him many times in letters not to take the drug. And he is one of these people with post-finasteride syndrome, supposedly. Now, in him, I think it's purely psycho psych psychological. Uh, is it psychological in everybody? I, I believe that it's a real syndrome in some people. I don't understand the mechanism for it. Uh, I, I wish I had better insights into this. I haven't seen any good insights by anybody publishing today of, that shows a mechanism that post-finasteride syndrome works. But I, I believe if a patient has it, if he tells you he has it, uh, other than this uh, kooky guy that I'm talking about, uh, I think you have to believe them. And I th therefore, I think patients should be informed ahead of time that it's a potential risk before they go on finasteride. It's part of the informed consent. We as doctors have to give every patient before we start them on any, any drug. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that there are comorbidities out there, you know, and some people have baseline uh, 
sexual, you know, complications or issues um, in their personal life. Some people have depression and anxiety and, you know, maybe the medication can potentiate some of those underlying conditions. It's, I agree, it's unclear with the literature, but I think there are certain things that you need to be on the lookout for even when prescribing finasteride in, in the first place. And I've had some patients where it can elicit that history from them even before offering them the finasteride. And I'm like, you know what, maybe this isn't the right medication for you. Because if they're already having some of the conditions or symptoms of what people describe with post finasteride syndrome, surely starting them on the medication is not going to help anything. So I think that is sometimes the case too. You know, it's not like we're all starting at the same place. So just to end here with um, just some rapid fire responses, just with certain keywords that we hear about often um, as comments on our videos or just in our practice. Uh, and just wanted to kind of get your uh, initial thoughts. The first is uh, exosomes. I think the, 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 the answer on exosomes is still out. I don't think we have any really solid clinical science uh, to back up that exosomes work. As you know, exosomes are produced by every cell in the body. Every single cell in the body produces 20,000 exosomes a day. So think how many cells we've got in the body and how, much exo how many exosomes are circulating in our bloodstream at any one time. And we know that exosomes are communica chemical communication vehicles to communicate from one part of the body chemically to another part of the body. And these instructions are packeted in these little exosomes that measure between 20 and 50 microns in size. And I think for us to take a view that that these little packages, which contain lots of messages of a lot of sorts, uh, packed into a single um, uh, spin-off from a blood sample would be enough to regrow hair. Uh, I, I think I'd want to see some good clinical evidence on that, which I have not seen yet. Yeah, and I think also just uh, based on what you were saying earlier with quality control when it comes to surgery, I think quality control has been an issue with uh, exosomes and the way that they're manufactured, you know, trying to make sure that every vial has the same exact number of growth factors and knowing exactly what's in it um, has been an issue. And I think that's why it hasn't been FDA approved yet. Uh, next one is hair cloning. Uh, back in, I think it was 1987, a man named Jehoda uh, cloned a hair follicle with his, he and his wife on, on the leg of one or the, one or the other. They moved the hand, hair clo and actually cloned the hair. That's never been replicated clinically uh, since. Uh, there have been people that have been successfully cloning uh, hair in petri dishes. As those cloned hairs are put into mice or animals, the death rate was almost 100% because these things got infected. So there isn't a solution yet to hair cloning. You have to remember that every single hair follicular group, every follicular unit, is an organ, a complete independent organ. And you need, well, I, I told you earlier, yeah, Typical Caucasian has 110,000 hairs on the head, 50,000 follicular units. That means he's on the hair, you've got 50,000 individual organs growing hair on your head. And, and putting them in to guarantee the right direction at any one time is, is a long way away. Next one's uh, stem cells. Not the stem cells like within the follicles, but some people ask about like, stem cell transplants and okay, do you guys offer stem cell treatments? I get that frequently. I don't know what's in the stem cell treatments that people are publicizing. Uh, I know a lot of doctors are offering it. I know that uh, many people, that, that stem cells are sold in Korea and exported. I think that ban has been placed by the FDA uh, to not allow them in the United States. So I believe that that's still an uh, open-ended question as to whether there's any value with that. Occasionally, I'll do a, like a fat transfer procedure for someone uh, for their scalp to, you know, if they have a history of scarring or if they've had numerous other surgeries that really haven't like worked um, just instead of just doing another one the same way. Uh, we, we've done that on occasion and that, I guess, can potentially transfer their own stem cells into the area, give it a little bit of a healthier bed. Um, to receive the the hair, but yeah, be, beyond that, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what people are are offering with stem cell treatments, but that would be, I guess, the closest that I come in the practice to, to giving people stem cells back. <laughs> and I think there are good clinical indications for that, and and I do believe yeah. that these fat fat transfers do bring stem cells across. And the last one is rosemary oil. 
yeah, there are a lot of uh, oils of different sorts. Uh, if you name the oil, somebody has promoted it as a uh, great growth factor for hair. Um, so I, I don't, I can't comment. That's all I have for today. Wanted to thank you, Dr. Rossman, not just for you know joining me today, but just for like your overall contributions to the field, to hair transplant, hair restoration. Uh, it's it's been incredible. Uh, you know everything that I've read, not just in your resume, but you know, and in the textbooks and the literature. So um, very uh, you know honored to to be talking to you today, and I hope to see you at an upcoming meeting and uh, and to try out your new devices and, and see what else you know you come up with. Great. I look forward to maintaining our communication, you and I.